<laughs> what the? Bandicoot with pants on? Okay, he do be looking kind of fresh, though. Are you an everyday nerd? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so that you don't miss the next episode. Yo, welcome back to Your Everyday Nerd. I'm your host, Zack Snyder. If you're new around here on Yen, we pull from every corner of nerd culture and talk about anything and everything that piques my interest. When I was about seven or eight years old, after going to church, my mom would take me and my siblings over to her friend's house. She had a couple of kids who were much older than me and one of them owned a PlayStation 1. At the time, he played a lot of this particular platforming game that featured a strange animal who had an affinity for spinning around and destroying boxes. This was Crash Bandicoot. See, I didn't really have any video games of my own at this time, so I really only had a chance to play a couple of levels of this game here and there, but for some reason this 90s icon left such a big impression in my mind. From that point onwards, I would look forward to the day that I too could crash my own way through some boxes. Years passed, and with the release of the Insane Trilogy on PC, I finally got to play through the very first Crash Bandicoot game. My eight-year-old self remembers this game in glimpses, so today let's take a look at it and see if it met those wild expectations. <laughs> If you don't know anything about it, Crash Bandicoot is a 1996 2.5D platformer developed by Naughty Dog and published by Sony. At the time, Nintendo and Sega were the big dogs in the industry, with Sony just getting into the game, so they had to find some way to compete. See, the 90s were all about mascots and platformers. Nintendo had Mario, Sega had Sonic, so Sony decided to come up with, well, this obscure marsupial from Australia that just so happens to also wear pants. Lucky for them, it did pretty well. A few sequels would later come out on the PS1, making up the original trilogy, which are now considered bona fide classics. We get a couple more entries for the PS2 and GameCube, which I personally don't know too much about, probably for good reason. There's the Game Boy games, which took away the 0.5 and the 2.5D, just stuck to strictly 2D platforming. There were party games, racing games. My point is that Crash is very similar to Nintendo's Mario, and the fact that for a very long time, he was pretty much the face of Sony. But then 2013 happened, and in penance for the world not ending in 2012, Activision bought the rights to Crash, and uh, they did nothing. We're not going to talk about Skylanders today. I pretend I do not see it. Fortunately though, the fateful year of 2017 happened and Activision did a good by teaming up with Vicarious Visions to return Crash to his original form in the Insane Trilogy, a full remake of the first three games. When I heard about this, I was personally super hyped and through a humble bundle to a sponsor, I got really lucky because I got not only the Crash remakes, but the Spyro remakes all for less than $12. You really can't get any better than that. I am so happy that I finally own these games. I'm definitely looking forward to talking about all of them, but today we've got to start with the very first Crash Bandicoot. Playing a bit of Crash as a kid, I built it up in my head as this massive, fantastical story about a bandicoot on his pursuit to get as much wumpa fruit as humanly possible. It turns out though that the story of Crash Bandicoot was a lot more simpler than that. We start out on an island where Dr. Neo Cortex and his assistant Dr. Nitrous Brio use a device to mutate various animals into beasts with superhuman strength. They experiment on a peaceful bandicoot, Crash, only for it to backfire and allow him to escape. After Crash escapes, Cortex kidnaps Crash's love interest, Tanya, and we play through the entire game as either Crash or his sister, Coco, defeating mutated beasts and going through platforming levels, all in hopes that by the end, we can defeat Dr. Cortex and save Tanya. As far as stories goes, this is about as much as you would expect from a 90s platformer. There's not a whole lot to it, and honestly, I had to look up the Wikipedia page to even remember what this story was. But story aside, it's the gameplay that you're coming to most games for, and especially Crash Bandicoot. Much like a 2D platformer, every level in Crash is fairly straightforward. You start the level, you get past obstacles, you keep moving forward, and even for the levels that have a couple of alternate pathways, as long as you keep moving forward, you're probably going to make it to the end of the level relatively simple. Where the 2.5D part comes in is where the gameplay starts getting interesting. 
In most levels, you can usually take advantage of the 3D space to find cleverly hidden extra lives, bonus stages, or even find entire hidden pathways. Platforming is obviously your prime objective here, but it's not the only thing you can do in Crash. Again, like most 90s platformers, there's usually some kind of collecting mechanic involved. I wouldn't consider this a collectathon though, because unlike actual collectathons where you need to collect everything to move on to more levels, you're not actually required to collect anything in Crash to beat the game. But let's say you're a mad lad. Let's say you're like me and you want to get that 105%. Well, here's what you have to do. First step, break all the boxes, all of them, on every level. If you do it successfully, you get a white gem at the end of each level. These gems can then be used to unlock a secret bonus ending, but we'll get to that in a bit, because you can't get all the white gems without first unlocking all the colored gems. And in order to get those, it generally means that you have to beat a stage, break all the boxes, and do it all without dying. These particular stages are usually much longer and much more difficult than any of the earlier stages, so needless to say, it's not going to be easy. After you get all the colored gems, you'll notice that you're missing a couple more of those pesky little white gems, and that's because you have to go get the two keys, which unlock two secret stages. You get those, you go to those stages, you unlock the extra pathways, you break all the boxes, you get all the rest of the white gems, and now you get the coveted bonus ending. Here's the ending. I'm giving it to you right now. It's nothing special. So unless you really have a thing for Tanya the Bandicoot, none of this is really worth the hard work. So if you feel like you're done playing the game after you beat the levels regularly, feel free to stop at this point. Personally, I enjoy playing the game enough to get all the gems. So if you do decide to do this, it is a bit of a challenge, but it's definitely not impossible. But then there's the dreaded, time trials now originally these trials weren't even in this game but with the insane trilogy vicarious visions decided you know what we hate the players of these games we're gonna add the time trials to all three of the games i don't recommend doing these at all the only reason i did it was because i was waiting to play more of the crash games on live streams and so i wanted to play more off stream and so i decided only thing i have left now is the time trial so let's do it fortunately Getting the bronze ones are pretty easy. It just came down to not dying in certain stages. But getting those gold ones, that was a long and torturous grind. And forget the platinum ones. I'm not even going for any of those because I don't care. And it really comes down to like this level. Where we go? There's a lot of cool levels in the first Crash Bandicoot. The high road is not one of them. Thankfully, you can somewhat cheese these levels and climb on the ropes the entire time, but that's honestly just as hard as jumping over the holes. I just thought it was a bit more consistent for me, but uh, all in all, there's just, if there's any kind of other stages like this in Crash 2 or 3, I'm probably not gonna 100% them because this was not fun. And don't get me wrong, there's definitely some other levels that took some trial and error too, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the bonus level that comes with the Insane Trilogy, Stormy F***ing Ascent. I hated this. And then I kind of grew to love it a little bit, but like in a Stockholm Syndrome kind of way. In other words, I still hate it. So back in the day when the original game came out, there was originally a level called Stormy Ascent. 
that didn't get put in the game because the developers thought it was too hard. And honestly, the original game, looking back on it in retrospect, looks pretty ugly, especially with this bonus level, so I can only imagine that playing this today would be pretty brutal. Fast forward to the Insane Trilogy and Vicarious Visions, again, decided they hate us. They went ahead and put this unreleased level as bonus content, and, and well, it's, it's absolutely insane. There's so much to this level that it takes minutes to beat it regularly. But that time trial, we're talking at least a minimum of four minutes and 30 seconds straight of difficult platforming without dying just to get the gold relic. The platinum one is three minutes and 10 seconds and I can't even imagine trying to grind that one out. There's tons of moving platforms, spikes, stupid scientists throwing things at you, little homeless guys trying to trip you up. And just when you thought you were gonna make it to the end, there's these spiteful little vultures that move in strange patterns that you have to make pretty precise jumps at just the right time to get to the very end of the stage. I died to these way more than I'd like to admit. This stage was a test of my patience. I don't think it's the most difficult thing I've ever done in a video game by far, but it's it's definitely up there. Right? It's going on the list. Needless to say, I am glad I'm done with the time trials in Crash 1. For a game that wasn't designed around being fast, it's an arduous task that required a lot of patience, and while I wouldn't say that it was completely worth my time, I guess I kind of am still glad that I did it. But time trials aside, the only thing I haven't talked about yet are the bosses. The bosses are easily the worst part of Crash Bandicoot. They're all very easy. They all have a gimmick that's pretty simple to figure out. And then it's just a bit of trial and error from there onwards. I do like their designs and they're definitely memorable as characters. In fact, it's the bosses that I remember the most from the small amount of time I played this as a kid. But the fights themselves are super underwhelming. When everybody was calling this the Dark Souls of platforming a couple of years ago, they immediately lost all credibility because of these bad bosses. Even the final boss fight with Dr. Cortex was a complete joke. But I'm being too negative. I promise I do like this game. While I was disappointed in the bosses, and while I was tired of the time trials, what I'm not disappointed in is the overall look and feel of this game. I really like the soundtrack. It works so well to establish the atmosphere and charm of these islands. The sound design too, from getting the Wumpa fruits to crashing through boxes to getting Akuaku, the mask power up that lets you get hit an extra time without dying, they're all very memorable and satisfying sound effects. The enemies are pretty varied and unique, and when you die, each enemy has its own death animation. It can be pretty frustrating to die, but if it's in a new way, it's kind of fun. On top of all this, I really love playing as Crash. He's a fun character to maneuver. His movement's not as versatile as other platformers, and there's definitely a bit more of skill required to fully grasp Crash at the beginning, but once you get over this initial hump, the gameplay can be extremely rewarding. I do have to take a second and complain again about Crash's jumps though. Apparently this was changed a bit in the Insane Trilogy compared to the original games. But in certain levels where jumps are super tight, sometimes it's difficult to gauge where Crash is going to go. So you're almost taking a leap of faith early on until you fully get the gist of his movement. It's super hard to describe, but there are times where you swore you made that jump and then it just didn't happen. It's something that I absolutely hated in my first five hours of playing this game, but now I'm just kind of used to it and it is what it is. It's almost like playing a rhythm game. I found myself constantly getting into the rhythm of these jumps, especially, especially during those time trials. But okay, we gotta talk about the elephant in the room. I briefly mentioned it. No, this is not the Dark Souls of platforming. When people talk about the difficulty of this game, it's pretty annoying, because yes, it definitely does have its difficult moments, but it's not nearly as hard as journalists are claiming. There are systems in place that allow less skilled players a better chance to succeed here. Death really isn't even a big consequence. You're constantly getting wump of fruits that increase your lives. There's multiple checkpoints through each level. At a certain point, you can start farming for extra lives, 
Also, if you end up dying too much on a level, certain boxes that were regular boxes before become new checkpoints. You usually get an extra Aku Aku mask when you respawn, which gives you an extra hit before you die. Plus, naturally, if you get three Aku Aku masks, you get invincibility, which is pretty much required on certain levels if you want to get that platinum time relic. So that's the thing. This is a game that is easily accessible to casual players while also facilitating a more challenging experience for overachievers. You could just as easily beat this game in an afternoon or you could spend a good 30 hours perfecting and completing everything. And I think that's one of the biggest strengths here. So did Crash Bandicoot live up to my eight year old expectations? Not completely, but it was still very much an enjoyable time. For some reason, I really remembered the boss designs from when I was a kid, but they were easily the most lackluster part of this game. I also remember certain levels that are most likely in Crash 2 or 3, and also Crash has a much more limited moveset than I remember. Maybe again, I'm remembering something from Crash 2 and 3. I still wouldn't call Crash Bandicoot 1 a bad game at all. The only thing that I really would warn new players about is that the jumping does take a bit of time to get used to and it will be frustrating at first. But once you get the hang of that, like this is a really fun game through and through. I definitely recommend getting the Insane Trilogy and playing it yourself. I had a really good time completing this game, though I don't think I would go out of my way to complete it again in its entirety. I definitely wouldn't have any problems like going back and playing certain levels over again in the future. If anything, it's done nothing but get me more excited to play Crash 2 and Crash 3. Well, I guess I'm a sellout now. Today's episode of Your Everyday Nerd is brought to you by Humble Bundle Choice. Humble Bundle Choice is the perfect way to get new games every single month at an affordable price. I can't tell you how many games I've gotten over the last couple of years because of Humble Bundle Choice, including the Insane Trilogy. For just $20 a month, that's like four Chalupa Cravings boxes at Taco Bell. You get nine games of your choosing along with access to the Humble Trove, a massive DRM-free library of over 90 games, as well as 20% off of all future purchases in the Humble Store. If you like playing video games, but you don't like paying full price for them, which is like all gamers everywhere, <laughs> Humble Choice is the way to go. If you're interested, check out the link in the description box below, and in doing so, you'll be helping out and supporting your everyday nerd. But that's all the time we have for today. If you liked the video, hit that like button. If for reason you didn't like it, hit that dislike button, I guess. Let me know down in the comments though, what are your thoughts on Crash Bandicoot 1? Is it the best in the trilogy? Have you played the other one? Which one is your favorite? Which one should I look forward to? Get excited for more Yen because we're gonna be pushing through more content coming straight to you. We're almost at a thousand subscribers. So if you're not yet subscribed, please consider hitting that subscribe button. In the meantime, again, thank you for watching and I will catch you in the next episode of Your Everyday Nerd. Goodbye.